Monday to Friday, Friday. 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. This is Today with Kino Kamis on Cape Talk. It is 24 minutes to 10 and a pleasure to once again invite and have on board today Chris Smith, the naked scientist. Morning, Dr. Smith. Are you well? Yeah, I'm actually. I'm a flu jab this week because, of course, we're into flu season in the Northern Hemisphere now. So everyone's going around having their flu jabs. So uh, I'm all tooled up, ready to combat the flu this winter. Now, do those work, by the way? People were saying about mm. flu jabs. When we, we had them, they said, oh, but they give you the flu symptoms. I don't want to get flu symptoms. Not true that flu jabs give you the flu. Not true that flu jabs give you full-blown flu symptoms. Not true that ah. flu jabs don't work. So those are all myths. What is true Good. is that up to 75% of the time, flu vaccines work. Why, why am I being cautious with how I say that? Because that's dubbed the vaccine effectiveness. Because flu vaccines are a guess. We have to look at what's circulating six months prior to making the vaccine on the other side of the world and then make an educated guess about what we think is going to arrive in South Africa's winter or the Northern Hemisphere's winter in the forthcoming season and then select what we think are going to be really good representative flu strains from from the millions of samples collected around the world each year and then make a vaccine out of those and then hope that the vaccine that's made out of them actually A, represents what ends up circulating, but B, also drives a really good immune response in the people you give it to. And those are uncertain. But we put into the vaccine about three or four different strains of flu. It depends which vaccine you use, which represent what's circulating. And so each of those individual guesses has got uncertainty and the entire combination has uncertainty around it. So that's why we can never be 100% right. But individually, those strain selections are usually very good. And so you'll always get some protection from at least one or two of the strains in the flu vaccine, ah. even if you don't get full protection across the whole lot. But doctors are cautious when they say, so at least up to 75% of the time you sh- you should benefit. But some years it- it's been better than others, to be quite honest. Yeah, we've got Susan in Rondebosch with a question. Hi, Susan. Good morning. Good morning. You can, Dr. Chris Smith can hear you, I can hear you, go for it. Uh, good morning, Dr. Chris. Hi, Susan. Now, my, my mother, in 1917, she had treatment for a tubercular gland on the left side of her neck. And I was born in 1929, and later on in my life, I had an abnormality in the left breast, and it uh, was a total mastectomy. Mm. All of it was taken away, and the glands under the arm. Can there be any connection? Hello, Susan. Um, First of all, the, the TB gland in the neck, this is a condition called scrofula, and it used to be a lot more common than it is today. And it used to be much more common because scrofula is most commonly caused, but not exclusively, by a different strain of mycobacterium, the bacterium that causes TB. This is called M. bovis, and this is bovine TB. And the common source that exposed people was unpasteurized milk. So the cow, or even sheep in some cases, would have this mycobacterium. It would pass into the milk. A person would drink it, and the TB bacteria would lodge in the throat, invade the lymphoid tissue in the throat, and then make its way to one of the glands in the neck, and then set up the kind of infection it does in the lung or in the core of your body when you have TB that you breathe in. And sometimes it would ulcerate out onto the outside world. And the the treatment largely was antibiotics, which once those became mainstream, we had things like streptomycin and now the much broader repertoire of agents that we use, the, these problems have largely gone away. You don't see people with ulcerating scrofula anymore. But equally, we pasteurise milk in the majority of contexts, which deals with the problem because the heat kills the bacteria. The issue with a breast is that the breast itself is a, a site where breast cancer can develop. And usually it's the epithelial tissue, these are the cells that line the ducts in the breast that are the glandular tissue that can become cancerous. The breast also has a lot of lymph- lymphoid tissue. These are lymph glands which are connected to it. The glands are in under the arm because the breast tissue drains into lymph channels that then go into nodes under the arm. So when a person has a problem 
for instance, a breast cancer, and the breast is taken away, or just the tumour is taken away, the surgeon will often have a fish around in the armpit and find the lymph nodes that drain the breast, because if the cancer that was there has spread from the breast tissue, then the first place it will usually go is to the lymph nodes that drain that tissue and those are under the arm. So by taking those away, one, it has a therapeutic effect because you remove something that might have some cancer in it, not exclusively, but might have some cancer in it, and B, it's diagnostically very useful because if you put them under the microscope, you can have a look, and if you don't see any cancer in those lymph nodes, because they've got the highest likelihood of cancer spreading there first, if it's not there, that's very reassuring that it probably hasn't spread anywhere else either. Okay, thank you very much for that question once again, Susan and Rhonda Bosch. Um, here's another one, and this one centers around the gym, Chris. Uh, when looking around the gym, some people perspire sweat a lot more than others. Is this an indicator that they are getting a better workout and you know, burning more calories? I asked Christoph Schreening, who's a physiologist at the University of Cambridge, this question. Uh, a couple of years ago, because he ama- is an amazing guy. He loves marathon running. He's, he must, I think he's run hundreds of marathons in his lifetime. Mm-hmm. And he turned up to the studio in Cambridge where I was interviewing him off of a train from London, having just gone and done the London Marathon. And he jogged into the studio. And I said, what on earth are you doing? And um, <laughs> he, he said, uh, actually, his strategy for doing the marathon and this sounds bizarre, but he said, you know, you run this 26 miles and you think the best thing to do, drink loads of water. He said, no, wrong answer. He said, I drank almost no water all the way around. I sprinkled bits of water onto myself to cool myself off. He said, and I weighed four kilos less at the end of the marathon than I did at the beginning. But he said, my time in the second half was far faster than my time in the first half. And the rationale for doing this, his strategy, is that as he loses weight through perspiration and breathing moist air out, which is what you do, which is why you see your breath on a cold day, he's losing weight. And if he's losing weight, he's doing less work moving his body. Therefore, if he's doing less work, tired muscles can move a smaller body more easily. So actually his time improved. So drinking a lot, water's heavy. And if you shove more water in than you actually need, then you retard your timing. But the point is, you can train yourself to sweat. And this is what he then went on to explain to me, which is that people, when they're not very well physically trained, A, the muscles are not as efficient, B, you're not as efficient, the sweating system and heat cooling system is not as efficient. So you have to really dial the thermostat up in order to, or the the compensatory mechanisms up. Sweat loads, you work up a massive sweat, but as you become more trained, your muscle efficiency improves, your exercise efficiency improves, and actually the efficiency of sweating improves. So you don't need necessarily to sweat everywhere quite as much in order to achieve a better thermal balance. So someone who's sweating really hard in the gym, yes, they could be sweating really hard because they're doing a really, really hard workout, and even a really well-trained athlete is going to sweat a lot. But someone who equally is ill-trained and hasn't trained their sweating system because you can train yourself to sweat more or less, then they equally are going to be... Uh, having a different sweating level as well. So it's not a given that lots of sweat equals either lots of hard work or a really fit person. It could be either way. And Bruce asks whether Prince Andrew can sweat. Uh, he didn't sweat in the interview, but I think he must have sweated when the Queen called him in for a bit of a chat. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It was Bruce, not me. I'm just putting it out there. Um, when one sneezes... Why does the act of pinching one's nostrils and blowing hard tend to suppress the onset of more sneezes? Um, Is it fooling the brain into thinking that you've blown your nose? I've never tried doing that. I'm going to try doing that. Have you tried that then? No. Well, listen, I know that when I've tried, I've, I've wanted to sneeze. But then I can't for some reason. It just <laughs> doesn't want to come out because I've been distracted. I don't know if that's just my ADD. But, um, yeah, no. <laughs> that's, that's as close as I ever got to all of that, Chris, to be honest with you. No, I've had that. And I and my daughter, it turns out, uh, she told me she does the same thing. Obviously, there is this concept of the photic sneeze reflex. We've talked about it on the program before, which is if you stare mm. at a bright light when you're on the threshold of sneezing, 
the bright light can push you over the threshold and trigger a sneeze and you get enormous relief because there's nothing worse than wanting to sneeze and not being able to. And exactly. I, I have not tried the technique of pinching a nose. I will try that to see if I can suppress a, a sneeze that way. But I suspect that this is all to do with the fact that sneezing has evolved to clear the airways. It's there to detect either a chemical or a physical or some other irritation in your nose and that irritation stimulates fine nerve endings which are very sensitive to vibration, they're very sensitive to tickle and that all those things are activated by the sorts of stimuli I've just mentioned and they feed back into your nervous system to the brain stem and the brain stem sits below the main part of your brain and connects the spinal cord to the main part of the brain but there are lots of important clusters of nerves there that integrate lots of information and the sensory bit of the face corresponds to a certain cluster of nerve cells there and mm -hmm. they connect up in a sort of reflex arc to the system that triggers the sneeze which is a, a reflex burst of uh, air which is released from the lungs all at once and directed down the nose to dislodge whatever's irritating you so if you squeeze yep. the top of your nose i strongly suspect that the uh, squeezing either dislodges the whatever's irritating you physically or uh, mm -hmm. chemically or it distracts you because if you distract yourself away from wanting to sneeze you can also suppress the activity in the nerve cells or here's the other possibility you put your hand to the top of your nose in the process you cut mm. down the amount of light going into your eyes and therefore you reduce the photic sneeze stimulus as well that was a clever one i just thought of and so all those things integrated <laughs> together probably help to suppress a sneeze in a proportion of people and here's a short and sharp one kino please ask the naked scientist how old exactly is mother earth are all the continents, the entire Earth, of one age? Oh, no. The Earth formed about 4.57, 4.58 billion years ago. So 4,500 million years, give or take. And we have pretty good ages for the Earth because we can look at the things that the Earth is made of, the chemicals, and some of them are radioactive and we can look at how fast, because we know how fast the radioactive clock ticks, because when things break down radioactively, they turn from one chemical into another. So if we take a sample, we can look at how much of one thing there is relative to the other thing, and we also know what sorts of things the Earth formed from in the first place, so we know when that clock started ticking, and we can therefore work out how long all those materials must have been there together, as planet Earth, and it's, a, it's about 4,500 million years-ish. And we can do the same trick with the moon, which is how we date the moon. The moon's about 4.57 4 billion years as well, and the moon mm -hmm. formed because something ended up on a collision course with the Earth. It's a planet that's notionally dubbed Thea, and it smashed into the Earth when the Earth was very young, and the two planets merged but ejected a huge amount of material from the surface of the Earth, which then coalesced initially as a big shroud around the Earth, but slowly aggregated into the moon we have. And that's why our moon is so big. But the moon has a similar sort of age. OK, now back on to Prince Andrew, by the way, and this one from Brendan. He says, Prince Andrew says that he doesn't sweat when out dancing in nightclubs because of adrenaline surges in the Falklands War. Is this possible? Um, I'm dubious that uh, just a previous experience of adrenaline would lead to an inability to sweat, to be honest with you. That sounds very dubious. I've never come across anybody with that kind of thing because if you, if you had that sort of situation, anyone who'd ever had an exhilarating experience like coming on Cape Talk would immediately uh, lose the ability to sweat. <laughs> Doesn't sound very, very likely to me. Never come across it. But, you know, ev you know, the world's full of individuals. Prince Andrew is certainly one of them. So maybe he has some very strange physiology going on in his body, but I've never come across that as a as a. Uh, you should situation. get him onto your podcast. I I think we should introduce him to Christoph Schrening, get him to do the marathon together and see if, see if his, his time would go through the roof if he, if he doesn't sweat and he drink anything, wouldn't he? It'd be great. Absolutely. And hi, Chris. If a dog has a really good sense of smell, why, oh, why do they need to go so close when smelling other dogs' poo? 
Yeah, it's amazing this, isn't it? Because I've got a young puppy. He's called Bruce. You can tell Bruce, the producer Bruce. <laughs> but but I, 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 I didn't name him after Bruce, honestly, Bruce. But he's gorgeous. He is gorgeous. And he's Black Labrador, little little um, Black Labrador. He's actually now five months old and he has tripled his body weight. This is just amazing. The rate of growth of these animals is just incredible. Yep. But we were talking about this the other day because the, the dog... Uh, sort of does the usual thing that dogs do the first thing it does to introduce itself to you is shove its nose straight in your crotch you know <laughs> and it's like yeah you use exactly. all those birthday cards where it says oh don't mind rover he's just being friendly um but they all <laughs> do it they all do it and the reason that they're so interested in what's going on from a smell perspective is if you look at the size of any particular area in a brain the bigger that area is the more important it is to that animal and the 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 better it is at using that particular sense and if you look in a human brain about a third of our brain is devoted to what we see because we have adapted to be visual creatures we put enormous emphasis on what we look at dogs on the other hand the smelling part of their brain is more than a third of their brain so they put enormous emphasis on what goes up their nose and as a result they have amazing senses of smell their ability to resolve different smells and tastes and odors is legendary Mm. as we all know but some molecules diffuse move over shorter distances better than others some molecules travel further and you can change the what you actually smell the spectrum of odors you pick up and you can actually detect some things better if you smell more of them or less of them at a closer and greater distance now humans do this as well because if you've noticed everyone will notice that at certain times of the day if you take a breath in through your nose air will go up one nostril better than the other If you wait, say, 20 minutes to half an hour, that situation is very often reversed. And it now goes up the other nostril better, and the first nostril that was nice and clear is now less free-flowing. And this is because scientists have discovered that the smells, when they go up your nose, some smells are in massive abundance, and the more of them you can shove up your nose and get them onto the smelling part of your nose, the better. You'll smell a a smell more strongly. And this is called flow-limited diffusion, because these molecules Ah. are delivered and they very quickly interact with your olfactory system and you can smell them. Some molecules, though, are much less eager to engage with your smell system and actually slower flowing air suits the detection of those molecules better because they take longer to engage with the receptors and activate them. So it makes sense to have a part of your nose so that you deliver air really fast and get as much of the smell in as possible and smell those, and then another part of your nose which is detecting the ones that take longer to engage. So a dog, by going sniff, 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 works out the source of the smell and then homes in towards the smell and then does deep or shallow breaths in order to maximise the way in which it interrogates all the spectrum of smells that are, that are coming off. And when it comes to sniffing another dog's ass, by getting really close, it knows it's definitely getting the smells that are from that dog and not every other random dog in the district. Fascinating indeed. Now, your questions for Dr. Chris Smith, the naked scientist, on 21 or if you want to send a WhatsApp voice note, 72 567 speaking of which... I don't know if this has been answered before, but what's the science behind getting dark marks under your eyes when you're tired? From a tired mom, Jade in Rondebosch. Oh, that's, a, that's a cute question. <laughs> oh, I have sympathy with that one. Don't all parents. The uh, answer to this is that when we spend a lot of time awake, then we're upright most probably. And what most likely happens is that you get a lot of pooling of the tissue fluid in the space under your lower eyelid. Now, normally this would drain away into lymphatic channels which are to the sides of your eyes. And so when you lay back and and rest and recuperate, it drains sideways and away. If you're up all the time, the tissue is more likely to accumulate some of that fluid. If it accumulates the fluid, it puffs up a bit. If it puffs up a bit, then it actually is more likely to interact with the blue light that is is in the white light that's coming in and reflect that and absorb the red light. So it makes that tissue look darker and bluer and more purpley because the tissue is a bit puffier because you're tired. And that's the simple reason, we think. Okay, great stuff. And then... um... Uh, let's look, yeah, here's a nice one. Uh, now, we all know what, that we should brush our teeth at least twice a day, morning and night, for a minimum of two minutes each time. But if one were forced to cut one of those sessions down to one minute, which one should it be? 
I would go for the best time to clean your teeth. And if any dentists know better, because I'm not a dentist, so if any dentists dispute this, please do let me know. But I would go that the best time to, to do a, a good toothbrush is the night time. That's probably the one that returns the greatest benefit. What's my rationale for saying that? I think that because by the time you get to the end of the day, you've accumulated all the debris of the day, all the sugars, all the other sweet things you've eaten and all the muck from the daytime. And when you go to bed at night, your supply of saliva switches off. And the saliva supply is very important because it secretes into your mouth antibodies and it also secretes other antibacterial things that help to suppress the activity of the plaque, which is the stuff that the bacteria secrete onto your tooth surface. So during the night time, you don't have as much of your natural defence, the saliva, to suppress the activity of the bacteria. You do have that during the day. So therefore, if you clean your teeth at night, A, you wash away all the muck you've had going in during the day, you wash away all the sugars that might feed the bacteria, and you compensate for the fact that there's a lower saliva flow at night, and therefore you're going to defend your teeth best at night when you have a low saliva flow. And in the morning, you may well have just eaten breakfast as well and had some fairly acidy food, fruit for example, and these are going to erode teeth. And if you immediately go launching straight into the bathroom and scrub your teeth having just had breakfast... The evidence is that the enamel is a bit softer because of the acid in the food you've just eaten and you're more likely to erode your teeth at that time. So that's why dentists say uh, don't clean your teeth after breakfast, actually clean your teeth before breakfast if you're going to clean your teeth in the morning and then perhaps have some sugar-free chewing gum or something after breakfast to dislodge any other particles and, and maintain ah, saliva flow and wash things away naturally. So if I had to clean my teeth only once a day, I'd do it at night time, at the end of the day and then eat some chewing gum the rest of the time. I like the sound of that. And Chris, that's where we're going to leave it. Thank you very much and a wonderful weekend to you and the family, sir. Thank you very much and have a lovely one, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.